January 23rd, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible. Genesis chapter 41 from the Old Testament. At the end of two full years, Pharaoh had a dream. As he was standing by the Nile, seven fine-looking fat cows were coming up out of the Nile, and they grazed in the reeds. Then seven bad-looking thin cows were coming up after them from the Nile, and they stood beside the other cows at the edge of the river. The bad-looking thin cows ate the seven fine-looking fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. Then he fell asleep again and had a second dream. There were seven heads of grain growing on one stalk, healthy and good. Then seven heads of grain, thin and burned by the east wind, were sprouting up after them. The thin heads swallowed up the seven healthy and full heads. Then Pharaoh woke up and realized it was a dream. In the morning he was troubled, so he called for all the diviner priests of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I recall my failures. Pharaoh was enraged with his servants, and he put me in prison in the house of the captain of the guards, me and the chief baker. We each had a dream one night. Each of us had a dream with its own meaning. Now a young man, a Hebrew, a servant of the captain of the guards, was with us there. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted the meaning of each of our respective dreams for us. It happened just as he had said to us. Pharaoh restored me to my office, but he impaled the baker. Then Pharaoh summoned Joseph, so they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. He shaved himself, changed his clothes, and came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it, but I have heard about you and that you can interpret dreams. Joseph replied to Pharaoh, It is not within my power, but God will speak concerning the welfare of Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream, I was standing by the edge of the Nile. Then seven fat and fine-looking cows were coming up out of the Nile, and they grazed in the reeds. Then seven other cows came up after them. They were scrawny, very bad-looking, and lean. I'd never seen such bad-looking cows as these in all the land of Egypt. The lean, bad-looking cows ate up the seven fat cows. When they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had done so, for they were just as bad-looking as before. Then I woke up. I also saw in my dream seven heads of grain growing on one stalk full and good. Then seven heads of grain withered and thin and burned with east wind were sprouting up after them. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads of grain. So I told all this to the diviner priest, but no one could tell me its meaning. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, Both dreams of Pharaoh have the same meaning. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows represent seven years, and the seven good heads of grain represent seven years. Both dreams have the same meaning. The seven lean, bad-looking cows that came up after them represent seven years, as do the seven empty heads of grain burned with the east wind. They represent seven years of famine. This is just what I told Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the whole land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will occur after them and all the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will devastate the land. The previous abundance of the land will not be remembered because of the famine that follows, for the famine will be very severe. The dream was repeated to Pharaoh because the matter had been decreed by God, and God will make it happen soon. So now Pharaoh should look for a wise and discerning man and give him authority over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh should do this. He should appoint officials throughout the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should gather all the excess food during these good years that are coming. By Pharaoh's authority, 
They should store up grain so the cities will have food and they should preserve it. This food should be held in storage for the land in preparation for the seven years of famine that will occur throughout the land of Egypt. In this way, the land will survive the famine. This advice made sense to Pharaoh and all his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, Can we find a man like Joseph, one in whom the Spirit of God is present? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Because God has enabled you to know all this, there is no one as wise and discerning as you are. You will oversee my household and all my people will submit to your commands. Only I, the king, will be greater than you. See here, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I place you in authority over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his own hand and put it on Joseph's. He clothed him with fine linen clothes and put a gold chain around his neck. Pharaoh had him ride in the chariot used by his second in command, and they cried out before him, Kneel down! So he placed him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your permission, no one will move his hand or his foot in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name of Zephaniah Paneah. He also gave him Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, to be his wife. So Joseph took charge of all the land of Egypt. Now Joseph was 30 years old when he began serving Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Joseph was commissioned by Pharaoh and was in charge of all the land of Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced large, bountiful harvest. Joseph collected all the excess food in the land of Egypt during the seven years and stored it in the cities. In every city, he put the food gathered from the fields around it. Joseph stored up a vast amount of grain, like the sand of the sea, until he stopped measuring it because it was impossible to measure. Two sons were born to Joseph before the famine came. Azanath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, was their mother. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, saying, Certainly God has made me forget all my troubles and all my father's house. He named the second child Ephraim, saying, Certainly God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. The seven years of abundance in the land of Egypt came to an end. Then the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had predicted. There was famine in all the other lands, but throughout the land of Egypt there was food. When all the land of Egypt experienced the famine, the people cried out to Pharaoh for food. Pharaoh said to all the people of Egypt, Go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you. While the famine was over all the earth, Joseph opened the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians. The famine was severe throughout the land of Egypt. People from every country came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe throughout the earth. God, thank you for the story of Joseph. I, I know that we still have more to come, but gosh, I just love hearing about Joseph and his relationship with you. And it's very encouraging. You know, I, I think back, we just learned that Joseph's 30 years old when he's talking to Pharaoh. So if we kind of do some calculations that he'd been in Egypt for about 12 or 13 years, that we know when his brothers were bullying him. He had to have been a, a little bit older teenager, maybe 17, 18. So he's been ostracized from his family. He's been bullied by his big brothers. He's been thrown into a big pit to await being eaten by a wild beast. He's then been sold to strangers as a slave. He's been accused of having sex with his master's wife uh, and also lost the trust of his master. <clears throat> he's been thrown in jail uh, for quite a few years. He's had people who he's helped who've never in turn helped him, at least until this part of the story. Uh, he's had a 
a busy life <laughs> and one that's not very good. And, and I think back to all of the things in my life uh, that didn't go so good or I thought that they weren't going so good. And, and yet if I, if I look at them, I can trace all of them back to good things that eventually happened out of those. And we do have a little bit of vantage over Joseph because there's a chance that some of us have read his story before and so we know how things turn out. Like we read today that, that he gets to be head honcho of Egypt. And you have blessed him for his consistency and faithfulness and humbleness towards you. But I think, I think we relate a little bit more, not so much to the good part that he is now in charge of Egypt and and what that will look like for him and his family here in the next couple of chapters but we definitely relate to the persecution part whether it's just those days where nothing seems to go right to a bafflement of a friendship gone wrong or a relationship that just seems out of out of whack and we we say, oh God, don't make it be like Job. Don't forget about me. <laughs> and we tend to relate ourselves more to those low periods of our life. And we might even say something like, I'll be patient and wait until the, the good parts or the good seasons of my life. Christians are very famous for talking about seasons. <laughs> the good seasons of my life. And based upon what you're teaching us about Joseph, I don't, I'm not sure if those are the right things to say anymore. In fact, I don't know if they ever were. I think we should be thankful in all of our seasons. We should be thankful when we are in jail. We should be thankful when people are false accusing us. We should be thankful when we're put in charge of Egypt. We should be thankful because you are in charge of every single one of those moments in our life. You are not an unintentional God. You are a God of intentions. Everything you have done in our life and everything you will do in our life is intentional. It all has purpose. So when we're in, in jail or being accused of something wrongly <clears throat> or being lauded before the country being in charge of, we need to be thankful. We need to remember that that is intentional. And probably the hardest thing for us to grab and the thing that Joseph by far did better than I probably ever will in my life is remember it's never, ever, ever about us. The bad things are never, ever about us. The good things are actually never, ever about us. We try and make them be about us, right? But even when Joseph was talking to Pharaoh, he's like, this is not me. You have to understand I am humbled and blessed that God's willing to talk through me, but you've got to get it really straight. I am not one of your diviner people that you buy into the stuff that they say to you. I am a man of God and all of the glory that is happening here needs to be his. So can you imagine being a teenager and a young 20 year old and having pretty much nothing for a dozen years, being persecuted, being having to live in a jail, which is definitely not like the jails we have now. And so many of us, when we're brought out of those dark despair times into the bountiful times, like Joseph was, we take on the applause. We take on the, the yes, it's all about me. It's about the skills I have. Oh yeah, God gave me those skills, but gosh, it sure just makes me feel good. So God, I ask you today to help walk by my side and stop and be thankful for every moment of my life, whether it's good or bad in my filters, and just be thankful because you are being intentional with my life. My life is so valuable to you and everybody who is listening to this, their lives are so valuable to you that every single second of their life is intentional. They were intentionally thought of. They were intentionally brought into this world. They were intentionally loved by you. They were intentionally forgiven by you. And I ask that we praise you during these hard times. 
and remember those are intentional too there is a purpose and a point and it doesn't have to point back to us the purpose and points are all about you they're not about us so today when somebody cuts us off in traffic and we make it about us and we yell and scream remind us that maybe that person's in a hurry to get to the hospital because somebody they love has just been in a car accident That when the person in line behind you at the, or in front of you at the cash register has yelling and screaming kids and seems to be taking forever with her coupons and, and you just want to check out. In that impatience, God remind us that we are blessed that we have a supermarket with food that we can actually buy and, and in our purses or wallets, we have money to pay for the food that is in our cart. And that we are alive. We have the time to stand in a line to get food. And then let us stop for a second and realize the person in front of us, the people around us. And pray for them that even if they're reacting in a way that we wouldn't react or saying something we wouldn't do or doing something we wouldn't do. That we stop for a moment and be thankful for them for all the incredible blessings that we have in our life. God, today I just ask that we make it about you and that we praise you for being our intentional God and that when we believe that something is going bad, that you are actually intentionally making something about to be good in your time. God, thank you for these amazing stories in the Bible that you share with us. Let us really dig deep into them and realize that what we're attracted to, the good stuff, the rewards as we see it, is not the real story here. The real story is what we did when we didn't see it as a reward. And did we give the glory to you? In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.